Spinks, welcome to the show. For those of you who do not know David Spinks, he's the author of The Business of Belonging, which is my go to community book and a must read. He was, you know, the founder of CMX, which is a community company, events, services, business that got acquired by Bevy. And now he's back from a sabbatical, which I want to start there. Mm. You took, you took some time off. What did you learn? Mm, what did I learn? Well, I learned that sabbaticals are dope. First of all, uh, highly recommend taking a sabbatical. I mean, I, I think like one thing you learn is that burnout is something that you aren't always totally aware of in the moment, or you might know that you're tired or you're exhausted, um, but you don't really know the extent. It's the kind of thing that like, until you stop everything, like you put everything down and get back in touch with yourself in the present moment, only then do you realize exactly how empty your tank is. And so like, I was like, yeah, you know, I was, I was still kind of hustling and getting stuff done and working hard. And like, you know, I, I don't know that I would have told you that I was burned out before I stepped down from CMX and from Bevy and started my sabbatical. And then, and then I did sabbatical and I turned off social media. I didn't use social media for months. I turned off email. I didn't have any meetings. I didn't do anything for work. I didn't write. I did nothing. And, and I started feeling better slowly. It ultimately took me, I think a whole year to get back to hundred percent, but started feeling better. And you just start to realize like, Oh shit, Th this was an option to feel this way. Like you didn't even know that you could feel better, right? Cause you, all, all I've known for 15 years now of, of cranking on startups and business is like, I, I've only known that mode. And so it kind of just, I think the biggest thing I learned is that there are other states of living and you probably don't recognize it if you've been doing the same thing for a long time. And a good way to, to find it is to drop everything. Taking a year off is like goals for a lot of people, but for people who don't have a year to take off, like how do you, how do you take off some time, recognize that you're burnt out and then deal with it? And yeah, what, what, what advice do you have there? I mean, yeah, like from a financial perspective, I understand not everyone can take that time off. You know, my wife and I saved a lot of money um, over our career. And so, you know, we just are using our savings. My wife took the last year off as well. So we kind of did a sabbatical together, moved across the country, had another baby. So there's like a lot of other factors in there for us. Um, of course, like and anything you can do to step back and create space is always going to be good for you. And if you can't do a year, but you can only do a week, do a week. Um, I would say that for most people, you can take more time off than you probably think you can. I think a lot of people say like, I can't take even a day off. I can't take a week off. Like there's too much to do. You can, <laughs> you can, you'll be fine. Um, especially if you're at a company that has vacation time, like take it. If you have unlimited vacation time, great. Take unlimited vacation, <laughs> you know, put it, put it to use and, and things will not fall apart, even though you think they will. Um, right. Like a big, a big thing that, you know, I, I was struggling with was this was my baby. It was my company CMX and a team that I love to work with. And I was like, you know, what's going to happen to the company after I leave, and you know, there, there's, there's like a lot of ego in that, right. To, to think that, um, it's all about me. Um, but I, I've just been so used to being the leader of the company for so long. It's, it's hard to imagine it without me, but stepping back and, and this happened in small ways when I would take time off, it created space for other people to step up 
It created space for new leaders to form. It created space for other people to figure out what to do without me there. And a lot of really good things came out of it. So even leaving for a few weeks or a month and then coming back, you you might find that you're coming back to a more sustainable situation because there'll be a, you know, it'll be a lesson that it doesn't have to all fall on you. You don't have to do everything. You have really great people around you who can step up and help. What about leaving a community? You know, so <laughs> there's a lot of people here who manage communities. We're listening to this. We manage communities or even just manage audiences. Um, what do you do when you're starting to feel a little burnt out and you need to take a step back? Yeah. So I guess like the, the challenge with the community is you feel like you don't want to let the community down. Um, maybe you'll feel like the community will suffer if you're kind of the active leader of it and, and you're going to step away. Or, or you might feel like you're going to lose trust. I think that's something that a, a lot of community people struggle with is like, I can't leave my community. My com what, are, what will my community members think? Um, if I'm not even willing to show up, then how can I ask them to show up, right? Um, and those are all valid feelings and I've experienced them. Um, I think for one, it's it's all the more reason to be building up uh, a team around you and, and a more sustainable system if your community revolves all around you that's probably a red flag to begin with that um, it's very uh, it's overly centered on on one person and you're not creating more of a distributed sense of connection and responsibility and leadership so I think you have an opportunity there to make your community something that can and should live on without you two I think like you're human and communities will always gravitate towards leaders who are human and honest and direct and so if you tell your community that you've put your heart and soul and blood, sweat and tears into this community and you're starting to feel burned out and that you're going to need to take some time to yourself, any community that wouldn't be supportive of that is probably not a community that I'd want to be a part of, right? People who hear that experience will be able to relate to it, will be able to understand it, will be, will be grateful for everything that you've put into the community and will want you to take the time and refill because, you know, you, you have to bring the best version of yourself to your community if you want to be a great leader. So taking a month off, taking time off um, to be able to come back stronger is is a good thing for the community. And if you really feel like it's time for you to move on, it's time to hand off the reins to new leadership, it's time to transition, um, then that's going to be the best thing for the community as well. Because you staying on as a leader um, when you don't have the energy anymore, when you don't have the heart for it anymore, when you're not able to give it your all, um, and you're, you're suffering and you're burning out, it's not going to serve the community well. It's, it'll be much better to then hand off leadership to the people who, um, are going to bring that, that energy and, and that ability to, to stay really focused. So I came across this product today called... Atris, A-T-R-I-S. Their tagline is an AI community manager, an intelligent mm -hmm. community manager. So I'm, I'm just on their, on their website. I'm going to tell you a little bit what it does about what it does. And I'm curious, I'm curious if you think, yeah, I'm curious if you think like it could help in moments of, you know, community manager needs to step out for a bit and, or just even if you have a community manager, enhance it. So here's what it says. It says the problem, so it works with Discord and Slack. Um, and it says, when a customer joins your Discord, Discord is an, but Discord is a noisy platform and it's hard to find good information quickly, a confused community member is much more likely to uh, churn. Uh, in addition, it's hard to find links to documentation, tweets, blog posts. So what they do, how it works, you add training data. So Atris scrapes data from Slack, Discord, Notion, basically places where you have data. They, uh, they, they also monitor it. So if you like add new Notion pages, it gets added. You connect a bot. So then you connect like, it's basically a Discord or Slack bot. Then your community members could ask it anything. So it's basically like, I don't know if you've seen like Shopify has now an AI assistant in their shop app. Instacart has a like an assistant. Um, and then the use cases, it says like developer communities, fan audiences, video game tournaments. Anyways, I'm curious what you think about using AI 
and something like this to uh, to help community managers run sustainable communities. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's dope. And I was going to pitch you on starting a community manager bot product, but I guess they already built it. So uh, it's one of, you know, I've been keeping this long notes list of ideas of things I want to build over sabbatical. And that's been one of them. I, I, it, means, it makes perfect sense. Look, like there are things that humans are really bad at that we're not built for. Um, and one of those things is being able to hold and process really large amounts of data um, to be able to pull out the right data at the right time for the right information, um, for the right needs, rather. So for a community is a really good example, and any community manager knows this experience where, like, um, you, have, you have a few, if you break this down into, like, jobs to be done or specific problems that that occur, one is, Somebody comes to the community and um, a few things might happen. One, they might be afraid to ask any questions because they're new to the community. They don't want to ask the same question that's been asked before. They don't know the social norms. So um, they want to start learning. They want to start engaging. But it's a big leap to post in a community, especially a large established community. Um, and so... Uh, they might not at all, right? A bot can help with that because it creates a very simple, easy way for them to ask a question and get an answer to, the, to that question without having to interact with other people, which will help them become more familiar with the community, with the social norms of the community, with the basic questions that they might ask that will lead them to the point where they can be more comfortable asking a question. The same way they might go read all of your help docs and search your website and like they have to do all that work to get that information, a bot can make that easy. Right. Number two, they might um, they might go ahead and post a question, but yeah, it's the same question that's been asked a thousand times by every other person who who joins a group, right? Like in CMX, the amount of times that someone's come in and just been like, hey, how do you grow engagement in your community? It's like so broad that it's impossible to answer. We've seen it a thousand times. Or like, hey, what platform should I use for my community? It's like the same thing over and over and over again. And regular members will get pretty tired by that. Great, a bot can help eliminate that because if a bot can help answer, you know, the the top hundred most commonly asked questions, then that will lead your members to ask more specific, more nuanced questions, go into more detail, and that will lead to better conversations as well. Um, and then, uh, not just on the content side, but on the, you know, think about it as like the CRM side. So every community, especially you know, really large communities, so of thousands and thousands and thousands of members and every community manager knows this question hey who, who should i talk to about um building engagement for a direct to consumer product okay well let me see let me rack my brain for the sure. ten thousand people in in my discord or facebook group and think about like who's the exact right person who has experience with this maybe who's like based in your region who um, you know is at the right experience level, right? And like I just have to pull this up from my head. And so what we end up doing as community managers is we create these shortcuts in our heads, and we kind of have our go-to people. And so um, you know, if someone asks me for a specific recommendation, I'll either have that go-to person, and I keep sending everyone to that same person, which is one really overwhelming for that person, and two doesn't give other people the opportunity to help. So it's not very inclusive in that way. Um, or I just won't have an answer. I'll be like, I, I don't know. Honestly, I can't think of a person off the top of my head to introduce you to. Um, maybe you should just post in the community and ask, and maybe it finds the right person, right? But this is exactly what uh, AI bot can help with because it can take literally the CRM of your community. It can organize and categorize everyone in the community, not just based on like tags and stuff like that, but it can look at all the content they post in the community and know, okay, this person's a good expert in this topic. This person's an expert in this topic. And so imagine if you go to a bot and say like, hey, I'm hoping to meet someone with, you know, that can help with A, B, and C. And the bot can say, great, here's, you know, five people in the community that are active, that, um, that have expressed interest in helping other members on these things. Uh, let me know if you want to connect with one of them. You say yes. And then the bot goes to that person and says like, hey, this new member joined. They specifically asked about A, B, and C. Um, you're somebody who's has a lot of experience with this. Would you want to connect with them? Yes, they say yes. Great, bot connects them. 
Awesome. That's going to do that a thousand times more efficiently than any human community manager uh, will ever be able to do. So I, that's just like two examples. And I think there's a lot more where actually bots are going to be much better at large scale community management than humans are. I mean, this is going to be a, is a tough conversation to have, but you know, I feel like if anyone I can have it with you, you know, it's fast forward five years from now, do we even have large scale communities that aren't managed by these bots? Like is the, is the greatest community manager of a large community, a bot, or is it a human? Might be a bot. It might be a bot. Like be honest, honest, you know? I don't, I don't I'll, think I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. Yeah. Well, what do you think? I mean, it's, it's, it's a bot. It's a bot in the sense. <laughs> it's a bot. <laughs> because, it, you know, first of all, the bot is unbiased, meaning. Well, it, there's, there's, it's more unbiased than a human being. Sure. It, it has collective bias from all the human beings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just think. It's okay. Human beings are extremely biased, even if it's subconscious based on where they grew up, uh, what language they speak, their experiences in life, uh, that sort of thing. You know, the, the biases in a bot would be if, you know, the human who, you know, is behind the bot essentially, um, codes it in a way that, you know, inject some of those biases. But my thinking is a bot is probably has, if you compare a bot to a human being, I think a human being has way more biases than a bot. So that's one thing. True. Second thing is like what you were describing around, like essentially a community manager, like having this internal Rolodex that they're just sort of going through, like it worked for small groups of people, like how human beings were designed to like carry out community, like small pods of people, essentially not these mega discord or slacks or whatever, where you have tens, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people in there. Yeah. No breaks breaks. So yeah, yeah look like. Okay, so there, there's also a difference between, you know, if we could suss out the the question into into more specifics, like who's going to be running the community, bots or humans? Well, um, there are aspects, there are large aspects of the communities that I think are going to be run by bots. And we described a couple examples there. There are things that bots can't do um, or won't be as good at. Like, I don't know that a bot is going to build the community from the ground up. It's like recruiting people, um will be hard because that's sure it could optimize email outreach which is weird imagine just like a bot going out there and just emailing lots of people like it'll probably happen um but it can't it's not going to build relationships in the same way um definitely not if it's being transparent and it's saying it's a bot if you don't know it's a bot then maybe you can still build relationships to some stem to some extent um but I think growing the community will be hard. I think um, creative collaboration will be hard. Like a bot is good at summarizing and it, c it can even be creative to some degree of, but it it's limited by what's existed before. If you want to get people together to be ideating on something new, Right, like if if we ask ChatGPT right now, how do you measure a community? Its answer is going to be based on the best answers to this point on how to measure community. It's 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 not going to come up with a new way that we haven't really thought about yet. I don't think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, right. Not yet. Maybe, yeah. There there are layers that we might get to. Um, but so like there are things that humans will always come together for and and the actual conversation is going to be humans so one, one thing that's fun to think about uh the last thing i'll say on this uh is um we talk a lot about like leaderless communities how like oh it's it's kind of like a kind of one of those bullshit utopian community things that people say like a perfect community has no leaders um which like i don't know i don't think that's true but a mat, like a, a bot might actually be the most efficient way to get to that point where 
yeah, a community is literally all about the members because the leadership, the facilitation, the introductions, the sourcing the right content, the moderation, all that can be done by a bot. It's the actual conversation and interaction and relationship building that the bot's not going to do. And all the members can do that, right? And like, if you go to any community, that's like, sure, the leader could be facilitating conversations, but once a community is organically growing and running, it's the members having those conversations, building those relationships. So maybe the best way to get to a true leaderless community is to make the bot the leader. Here's where, maybe, maybe, here's where I think humans still have the edge on, on bots. Okay. So like, you know, being in a Slack, being in a Discord, something like that, text-based communication, that's like a low, low resolution conversation versus let's say, sharing images or sharing vi video or uh, having live video or being in person uh, with a lot of people, you know? So I think if, if you think of, if think of it as a spectrum, like the lowest level is just like essentially messaging back and forth. And a human being is is incredible at being in person and drawing upon personal experiences to create that connection that it, that really helps with community. So good news, community managers, you're going to outperform 10 on 10 on that because you'll be able to, let's say you're, you know, you're, you're hosting, a, you know, a yoga community, um, and you're doing like, you know, maybe you're doing hot yoga with 10 other people. You can be like hot yoga saved my life. I used to be, a meth addict and now I'm doing hot yoga and it changed my life. And a bot can't say that. A bot can't say that. No bot that I know. Not bot not yet. Not yet. At least. Until until bots start doing meth and <laughs> falling in love with hot yoga. Uh, <laughs> I love love the example. You're right, right. Like, you know, bots don't have trauma and humans connect around trauma. They connect around those shared experiences. And yeah, like in person. Bot can't do in person. Right. Not yet. Um, and, um, the more, the more human traits come into play, the less the bot will be able to provide that. Even like, and we already know like zoom feels less human than talking in person because there's all these little subtle things about how we interact. Like right now I can't look you in the eye. I can look at the camera. I can kind of look you in the eye. Right. But like, I can't look you in the eye. So we're actually on a chemical level, not able to connect on the same way that we're able to in person. And there, there's a chemical reaction that humans have uh, when we're together in person, when we can touch, when we can smell, when we can see each other, when we can look each other in the eye, when we can hug. Like these are things that bots are not going to be able to do. Um, and, and I mean, really like at the end of the day, we're in communities to connect with each other, to feel heard, to feel cared for, to, uh, feel like we're not alone and I don't care how good a bot this is why before I was like well it depends if the bot tells you it's a bot or not because it can use all the exact words that a human does but the very knowledge that it's a bot will undermine any sort of relationship that you can build with it it's gonna it's gonna tell you it's a bot like I think we're gonna you would I hope. think yeah I hope um you ever see the you ever see the Jetsons? Of course. Two interesting things about the Jetsons um, r regarding bots. So, Rosie from from uh, from the Jetsons, she was like the mm -hmm. mechanical mm -hmm. maid. Yeah. First is she called George and Jane by their first name. Uh, sorry, she never called George and Jane by their by their first name. Mm -hmm. she she always called them mr and mrs jetson or yeah. mr and mrs j which lesson there is like you're a bot of course you're like it was programmed to do one of those two things you either calling it mr j or mr and mrs j or mr and mr mr and mrs jetson so human beings are just like better at knowing like the context um and and especially with like the human you know, looking at someone's crying, looking at someone's laughing and based on that reacting in an interesting way. So that's one thing, uh, which is interesting. The second is 
her antenna always flashes and beeps at the start at, at and the end of her sentences. So every time she would say something, like clockwork, the antennas would go. And it's another example of how mechanical they make Rosie out to be, how she's like basically just coded. Um, and I think that's another issue with, with bots in general. Like that's the, that's the con of bots is that, you know, they're very, it's very difficult to get them in an IRL setting to act a bit differently. Hmm. Also, I just wanted to bring up the Jetsons. <laughs> Take every opportunity I can <laughs> bring up Elroy. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but like, these are, th these are choices that people made, right. To yeah. build Rosie that way. And so you, you would hope that people who build bots will build bots that always make it clear that they're a bot. But, you know, if someone chooses to build a bot and, and not have it tell people that they're a bot and it just says, you know, send out, I, I, I went through on my newsletter, like an example of can a bot build a community? Like, what would it look like for a bot? And I had it do all these tasks that I would do if I was launching a community. So I had to identify potential members. I had to identify potential leaders to bring in to do Q and A's. I had to write the email to invite, to like recruit people to join the community and try to make that as compelling as possible. And it did a pretty damn good job of writing an email that sounds compelling. That like it made it sound like a. I, I, I use a tree community, um, and and where everyone pretends to be a different kind of tree. And it came up with all these great tree puns and it like talked about the mission and the values of the tree community and how we all speak a tree language. Like it came up with some stuff that I'm like, this actually sounds like a, you, I don't know if everyone would be interested in it, but it sounds unique. Like people who are into it would be really into it. And so like a bot can send out a really compelling recruiting email. A bot can send out a really compelling onboarding message. A bot can start really interesting conversations. It can do pretty much all the things that a human would do when launching and managing an online community. And would you know that it was a bot? Maybe, or like sometimes you can tell, sometimes you can't. Um, so if someone chose to build a community and have the bot not tell people that it's a bot, I, I think that a community would still form and we would never know. Yeah, I think the ethics behind is this a bot or not? I think if the bot makes the, the decision to like send the email, then to me, the ethics, the ethical thing to do is to be like, this was sent by a bot. But if David Spinks is behind, you know, chat GPT in the sense that he put it, you put, you prompted it, you looked at it, then you might've changed a few words, you edited a few things. And even if you didn't edit, you just like copied and paste, but you're like, I proofread this, then I think ethically it's okay uh, to be like, yeah, I, 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 it's me, it's David Spinks. Um, just like it's okay to like, you know, if you're going from point A to point B in a car, um, like that's kind of like a mechanical thing helping you get somewhere quicker. Um, it's like a similar thing different <laughs> how is it different well my gps isn't like how i'm crafting my identity <laughs> you know your words are who you are it's how you're presenting yourself to other people it's how you're building relationships so you know isn't spell check like you know let's say you publish something on spell check and you have spell check isn't it a similar thing yeah like, what's the difference between chat similar GPT like it's a spectrum <laughs> on, on a you know, if you look at it as, as a, as a kind of grid, you know, on, on one side of the X axis, you have Google maps and on the other end, you have a full on, you know, her style robot. There's a spectrum there and, and using jet chat GPT to write an email on your behalf and not saying it is probably closer to the, her end of the spectrum than the Google maps end of the spectrum. So do you think that like what, what, what would you, like if you were running I, Apple, let's say, you know, would you make it so that if 
you know, every email you sent, if it was edited with chat GBT, it would have some sort of disclosure. Like, no. what should we do? So like, I'm not, I'm actually not, I'm not saying that it's wrong for, you know, Greg to use chat GPT to get a client to pay their bill. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's okay to do that because I think I, you're still reviewing that and you're making the choice to say like, these are the words I choose to send. You're making that choice. I don't think that's unethical for you to use chat GPT to give you the words. For the record, that been more used. For the record there, you know, you're referring to how I recovered $109,500 from a client who wasn't responding to our emails and I used ChatGPT to do it. I actually, what I didn't post in that thread is that I drafted the, the email. I, well, I prompted it. I got that. Uh, I edited a couple of things. I actually sent it quickly to my lawyer. I was like, is this like a good collection? Uh -huh. And she was like, it's perfect. She, she didn't hit no <laughs> <human comment>. review. <laughs> yeah. No comment. Send it. A lot of people ask me, Greg, how do you build products that foster community? Well, I've got good news. That's exactly what Late Checkout does. My company. We partner with the largest brands in the world and fast paced startups to design products that resonate with your community. We add a couple interesting clients every single year. So if you're interested and that sounds like you, email frontdesk at latecheckout.studio with what you're working on, what you need help with, and don't forget to mention the Where It Happens pod. Thank you. Yeah. So, so yeah, you, you know, even if you didn't do that, you, you were still the human reviewing it and it's you, you're sending it under your name and you chose to go ahead with those words. So, you know, I don't think it's unethical any more than, I don't know, this dude is using a ghostwriter unethical. Um, maybe, maybe that's even more unethical because you're like kind of using someone else's creativity to write on your behalf. Um, but like a bot just giving you the words to use. It's great. And, and going back to the community example is, is actually, I think, really good for us as community builders because the amount of emotional labor that we have to take on to manage communities, like how much, if when I have a situation in a community where I have a member who is, I have members who are fighting each other, or I have a member who's really angry at me or at our business, and I have to uh, de escalate conflict or I, I have to, um, you know, respond to someone who's really upset with me, that takes so much emer emotional energy to come up with the right words to thoughtfully engage with people. And community professionals, community builders, we have to do this day in and day out. And that that those are the most extreme ones, but even small ones, you know, someone who's having a hard day and we want to give them the right words. Um, someone who's having a challenge at work and you want to give them something very practical. It's just a lot of energy that's constantly going into helping community members. And that's another thing I did in the newsletter example. I had ChatGPT respond to um, someone who made like a vulgar comment in the community. And it was really good. Like it was maybe better than what I would have written to moderate a community when a, when a member violates the rules and says something offensive. And great, now I can take that, edit it a little bit, and I didn't have to spend half an hour perfectly wording this highly emotional piece of text. Now I can, as a community builder, do this much more sustainably. Also, like, you're the goat of community. So the fact that you, who has so much experience, you know, being a part of hundreds, if not thousands of communities and seeing it firsthand get something back from a robot that's like really good if not maybe even better that we can come up with quickly i think quickly is is is, is the important piece because like yeah maybe if you spend 30 minutes like drafting it it would be great but you you know you're busy you've got 100 things you're doing you're, you know your baby's crying you know your employees this you know there's a lot going on so i think um the cool thing just about AI in general is it allows you to be multiple places at the same time. It certainly makes you more efficient. And we talk about it from a time perspective, but I think the emotional perspective is also really important. Yeah. yeah. 
So shifting gears a little bit, or maybe not shifting gears that much, uh, you, you have all this knowledge and community. Um, you're a free agent. Uh, there's this AI boom happening. There's a community based businesses boom happening. How do you thinking about a framework for what you, you want to do next? Hmm. I have no idea, man. It's such a, I feel like I've written three newsletter articles about like what I'm going to do next and all of them kind of start with like, I have no idea. Um, I, what I'm doing right now is, is a few things. Um, I'm writing because I like writing. Um, I mean, I hate writing, but I like the outcomes of writing and I like the end products of writing. Um, I like the torture of writing. And so I'm doing the newsletter. I really enjoy that. Um, writing is how I'm going to get motion to put myself in the position to find things that excite me. I think it's really hard people who just kind of sit around and wait for a lightning to strike and to get inspiration on something they want to work on, but they don't move their feet. They don't get any motion. It, it's you're just hoping that it finds you. But I think by writing, by putting stuff out there, by putting content out there, you you're essentially putting out these signals. You're connecting with people. You're thinking, you're processing, and so that's what I'm doing. I'm just thinking, processing, sharing, writing. Um, so I'm putting a lot of my effort into the newsletter right now. That might become my full-time thing on its own if I can really generate enough income from that, um, or it might lead me to whatever comes next. Beyond that, I'm consulting. Um, so I have uh, three clients right now. I have two more I might sign, and then I'm probably pretty booked up. Um, and I've just, you know, I, I enjoy that because it, it gives me lots of ideas to write about. For one, I get to work with a lot of different kinds of companies. I'm working with a company that's doing micro schools. So it's a very unique community problem. I'm working with a, a physical gym and, and personal training company. Um, and so uh, I enjoy doing that. It gives me a variety of different kinds of community problems to solve. Um, I'm doing this talent collective thing as well. So I'm helping companies hire for community. I have over 160 really incredible candidates that I curate in, in the collective and I help companies who are hiring connect with them. They're all people who are open to new uh, job opportunities. Um, and that's mo mostly been a way to just help people through kind of the layoff uh, crisis that's happening. Um, and for me, it's 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 another kind of I'm, I'm sort of testing different products that can be passive income as well. Um, I'm, I'm sort of designing more of an independent uh, creator lifestyle business to see if I can do that. You know, I have two kids now. I'm not feeling so motivated by like trying to do some big VC back thing. I'm feeling more motivated by having autonomy of time and lifestyle and being able to pick up and drop off my kids and, um, spend my time doing the work that I want to do. So, um, you know, I think lightning might strike. I, I remember how I felt when, when we started CMX and the energy I felt around that. Um, it, it was like, I couldn't stop myself. I, I wanted to throw everything I had into that. I don't think I've found that thing yet. Um, when I find it, I'll know it until then. I'm just going to keep writing. Okay. I got a, I got a fun set of questions to answer which uh, you're going to have to answer it. So I you're here. No. You're here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you've interviewed some incredible people at CMX. I'm going to go through a, f a list of those people, a short list of them. Mm. And I'm going to ask you if that person at, you know, was giving you advice on what to do, what do you think they would say? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So to start, one of my favorites, and I know one of your favorites, Seth Godin. If Seth Godin was <laughs> sitting here and he was giving you advice on what you should do, what is the one thing you should do, what do you think he would say? It would be very short and poetic. I think I think he would say um, something along the lines of, do what's do what's in your heart do the thing that you can do in a way that no one else can do it i think he's always been very much about um finding the uniqueness in yourself and that one thing 
or voice or message that you can bring to your work, to the world, to marketing copy, to anything um, that that uh, comes from your unique story and your experience and no one else can do. And like, you can only find that by going inward. You can't find that by like looking for the best market opportunity or trying to make money. You can only do that by kind of looking within yourself. That's what I think Seth would tell me. <laughs> I love that. Go, go inward and, and, you know, keep going. Uh, number two, our, uh, our friend, Ryan Hoover, what would Ryan say? <laughs> um, I think Ryan would be a little bit of the opposite of Seth. I think Ryan's a very pragmatic business mind, uh, who would kind of see the opportunities in kind of like business, uh, community-based businesses that's growing. Um, you know, he and I have talked in the past about doing like a course together or, um, you know, I've talked to him recently about, um, one thing I thought about is doing a sort of fund for community. So being able to invest in, uh, community-based companies and community-based software. Um, and he obviously knows a thing or two about that. Um, so I think he, he's someone who just like sees re he, he is such a good finger on the pulse of tech and products and kind of the zeitgeist of, of business. And I think he would, he would spend a lot of time helping find like where things are going and what I can build to, to put myself in the right position to catch that momentum. I agree. I think he would want, he, he would want you to, you know, you've got so much built, built up knowledge and you're in the right place in the right time. And I think he'd want you to build the right product for that. Um, so I think that that's true. A few more, um, Scott Heiferman, uh, who founded meetup.com. <laughs> he probably told me to start a nonprofit. <laughs> I feel like Scott's like one of the most authentic community founders in the game. And um, I haven't talked to him about this. I'm curious what he would say, but I get the vibe that he's like, if he could do meetup again, it would be more of like a Craigslist Wikipedia style, just like open belongs to society kind of platform. Um, and I think like he's just a visionary with with those kinds of community um, platforms and, and building tools for community in, in, in that mindset. And so, um, I think he would probably tell me to look at like what society needs the most right now and forget about market, forget about business, forget about the capitalist aspect of things. Just what's the most human impact I can have, uh, by building community, uh, tools or software or, or programs. Okay. We're going to do three more. Joe Navarro, who is <laughs> famous for the power of nonverbal communications. Oh, that's a tough one. That, first of all, my, my interviews and work with him was a long time ago. And he, yeah, so he's an FBI agent who, um, you watch his shit. It's amazing. Like the stuff he shares about like how you can read people based on their body language and their emotion. He probably would have watched this interview and, noticed how my face was twitching at certain points and where my hands were. And he'll say like, Hey, when you said these three things, you seemed really confident. But when you said these three things, you lost confidence and you felt very uncertain about yourself. So you should probably focus on those three things that, that made you act confident. And I have no idea what those are. So if Joe watches this, let me know. David Marquette former nuclear submarine captain <laughs> and author of turn the ship around. What would he say? Ah, uh, David's awesome. That's such a good book. Have you ever read that book? No, but, uh, I hear it. It's, a, it's like one of those must reads, right? You should read it. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Um, Shane, Shane Mack was who introduced me to totally Lieutenant David Marquet originally. And he's amazing. He's just like the kindest person. I got to go down actually for, three or four days and spend time with him in his house, um, down in Florida, like lived right on the ocean. And we just like riffed on business and community and leadership. 
um, and just like hung out. It was it was really it was special. And that was like we barely knew each other, and he just like invited <laughs> me down to do that. He's like that kind of person. Um, and um, what would he tell me? Um, I I, th- I think David just like uh, he's a true true blooded leader. It just it kind of just flows through him and you'll see if you see him speak if he interacts with people he's just somebody who exudes leadership and thoughtfulness he's like very likable um very inspirational so you know i think and i think what he knows best is he's he's uh you know become this great author and speaker and and that's what he does for a living now since he was you know retired from being a nuclear submarine captain so a little different (laughs) So he'd probably tell me, he'd probably advise me on that path um, to continue to grow as a leader um, for community builders to speak, maybe write another book um, and understand, you know, he's he's done the whole independent entrepreneur path. So maybe he could teach me how to do that. Alexis Ohanian, uh, co-founder <laughs> of uh, Reddit 776 Venture Fund. What would uh, Alexis say as an OG community product guy? Hmm. That's a good question. What would Alexis say? I think like Alexis gives me some similar vibes to Ryan in some ways, like mm-hmm. someone who just is so plugged into the zeitgeist and sees the big opportunities way way ahead of a lot of other people. Um, and he just kind of brings a community mindset to every product, every company he works with. It's like there's always like a community undertone to it um what would he tell me to do i don't know yeah maybe maybe similar to ryan in that you know there's an opportunity to to invest and to um I, yeah i think maybe that's it i think something that alexis does is um and i what seems to be a priority for him in the last several years as he's kind of evolved is like really rising up a lot of other leaders Mm. And, and, um, whether those are like partners in his firm or other entrepreneurs, um, or like investing in communities or his like passion for, um, the, um, you know, women's soccer leagues and things like that. So I think he just like wants to rise others up and, and give, I think he has a big voice, uh, uh, a big focus on giving a voice to people from, underrepresented groups and so i think he would guide me in that direction of like how to have an impact on giving the next generation of community builders and maybe great community builders who aren't getting their voices heard how can i um how can i help rise up their voices okay i got a bonus one these one. are hard you yeah, pre- I, listen, this is great. when i invited you on i didn't i didn't say it was going to be uh super easy but i think you, you when we when we when when i invited you on i was like hey let's have a you know a conversation and we're having a conversation this is true this is, has a broad promise a cover- <laughs> this is indeed a conversation <laughs> so the bonus one and perhaps my favorite one is what would 2014 david spinks say to 2023 david spinks 2014 because because I think that's when I met you basically we were both living in San Francisco um mm. and you you know it was early days of CMX uh from what I remember you were just getting it started um starting to see some traction um and you were doing it at a time where a lot of your peers and friends were doing like these big venture back things and you were doing like more of a bootstrap thing in community which was like not very you know, attractive at the time. Um, yeah. What would he say to, to you? Hmm. That's a really good one. I think he would say to look for opportunities in places that you, that you, that you love, that you have a passion for, but you, you feel like 
it's too small or there isn't a big enough business opportunity. So I, the re, where I'm going with this is like when I, when I started CMX, um, I did not intend for it to be my full-time thing. Um, uh, it was my buddy Max Altschuler, um, and I started together. I had told him about the idea for the conference um, over the years before that we got to know each other. And he was like, in 2014, that's when he was like, hey, do you want to do this? I know how to run a conference. I'll handle logistics and you lead speakers and kind of the brand and everything. And so we did it. I was still running. Um, I was I co-founded a company called Feast with my good friend Nadia, um, who I think you know as well. Um, and we were still doing that at the time. And see, it frankly wasn't going that well. And um, money was getting tighter and tighter. And so CMX was in part a way to like bring in some extra income. It was an idea that I've had that I was talking about for a long time, but never pulled the trigger on. And, and part of the reason was I never saw community as like, this is the thing that's going to be my big break as an entrepreneur. Um, and at that time I was definitely more focused than I am today at like, I was looking for like, you know, what's the big thing? What's, what's the thing that I can really blow up that's going to, um, hopefully generate wealth to have a lot of impact to like be the big business that I want to build. Right. I wanted to have that kind of success under my belt. And I start, you know, feast was like an online cooking school. It was like completely different. Um, before that I worked with uh, seat geek and I did a, and like an online blogging platform and community was always a thread through everything I did, but it was never like the thing. And people always called me the community guy back then. Like even when I was first early in the career, they're like, Oh, David Sphinx is a community guy. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not the community guy. I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a founder. I like build businesses. I'm not the community guy. Like, yeah, okay, but like talk to us about community. And then I talked to him about community for hours because it's what I loved and it was my passion. Um, and then it was only after that first CMX and just being in that room with all those people and feeling it and and seeing the reaction from people who like got a lot of value from that event and felt like they weren't alone for the first time in their career and having those conversations that I was like, oh, this, this, this is what I've been meant to do. Like actually the way for me to build something great as an entrepreneur isn't to go around community, it's through community. And so I think 2014 Sphinx would say, keep an eye out for those kinds of things now. What are the things that feel peripheral that you love and you just, for whatever reason, have an assumption that it's not the thing, maybe inspect that and you might find some gold. Related to that, someone uh, DM me something I said on the My First Million podcast, which I have no recollection of saying. It's like, <laughs> it changed my life. But what I said was, and I wrote it down, when you think about what you want to spend your time doing, think about what you spent your time doing. Meaning, mm. like, if you're... Um, like spending hours talking about community, like there must be a reason why you're talking about it. Like, you know, you're, you're, you're curious in some capacity or you have this innate understanding of it. So I think that's a really, it's an insight. I don't even know if I said it, but apparently I said it, um, <laughs> that, you know, someone it was either you or Aristotle. I, you know, I always get you too confused. Yeah. It was me, Sam Parr or Sean Forey said it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I think uh, I get enough credit for for these these one liners. We should give you this one. Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, I think you. Twenty fourteen Sphinx probably had that in mind when when he was giving you this present day advice. Um, I like doing this exercise because it's like the personal board of advisors mm. uh, framework, which is like in your head, who would be like your personal board of advisors, living, dead, uh, people, you know, people you don't know, you can even, you know, add people that you don't know onto that list and, and say like, um, you know, I don't know, Gary Vaynerchuk, let's say, but what would Gary Vaynerchuk say about this? Um, what would my grandfather say? What would my, you know, and then you can play it out. And it, and the reason why it's helpful during crossroads like this is, and, and this actually goes back to biases too, is everyone 
is going to give you advice and everyone has some biased advice. And sometimes it's good just to like get as much advice as possible. And then from that, see what really sticks with you, what feels good. Um, so I'd leave you with, with that David Spinks. Um, and, uh, I'm happy, uh, you got to join us for, for an episode. I'm absolutely honored to be here. Always, always fun to jam. I feel like we could do an entire podcast, like show, like launch a new podcast and just do this. Totally. <laughs> we can talk about community. So maybe that's, what, is that the advice that Greg Eisenberg would give me? What do, you think, what do you think 2014 Greg Eisenberg, what, you know, advice, what, what would he say? And what would 2023 Greg Eisenberg, <laughs> what would that do? Um, I don't think, I don't know that 2014 Greg Eisenberg feels that different than 2023 Greg Eisenberg. I feel like you've been pretty steady. I don't know. So yeah, what would that advice be? Um, what would your advice be? If only I could ask you. <laughs> um, I know. Yeah. Your advice. I, I'll, I'll just share the advice you've given me, which is, you know, find the fun. Yeah. You know, find the thing that brings you joy. Um, and I, I think I actually, I think about that all the time. I think, it's, it's hard advice when I, the way I used to apply it is like, I'm like, oh shit, like what brings me joy? And then I start thinking about it and it's, you start trying to like find the things that bring you joy. It's like, well, I like playing basketball, but like, like, is that, that I don't, I don't see a thing that I'm going to do there. That's like my business or my, my career. And I don't know that I want that to be my career. It's kind of like my fun thing. And I always kind of go in that loop, but the way I've been using your advice, just so you know is like as a filter whenever I come up with ideas. So I have this long list of ideas of articles I want to write and projects I want to launch and people I want to collaborate with. And it's easy to start feeling overwhelmed because like, all right, well, there's all these things, which one should I do? And and you start to think about the criteria for, you know, what what you should focus on. And I've just found that that advice is really helpful in those moments to go through it and just feel like literally pay attention to your heart and what what's what's getting you going when you look through it, what's something that feels like it will bring you joy if you do it. And that, that's been a really helpful gauge to eliminate some things that like seem like good ideas, but I'm like, I don't want to do that every day. Um, and find things that I like, actually that there's some things that seem like they might be really fun to do there. And I should explore that more. Someone once asked me, what is the purpose of life? And I remember being like, first of all, I'm not Gandhi or, uh, you know, Mother Teresa, but I'll take a stab in answering it, which is have the greatest amount of moments that are like the greatest ratio of pinch me moments that you can possibly have in your life. So for example, like if you're going through life and you're not like pinching yourself being like, wow, this is so like incredible, amazing, whatever, then do things that try to get you, you know, pinch me moments. And this can be in business, meaning like doing things that get you really excited, having great meetings, closing business, creating products that do really well, but it can also be in like life, right? Like having a child, you know, you've had, you know, two children now, and that's many pinch me moments could be a lot of different personal milestones. And it's really about architecting your life around these pinch me moments. So, um, yeah, I think my, yeah, that's something I just add to my advice to you is just what's something that, you know, you're going to be optimizing for pinch me. Um, thank you, David Spinks. People could follow you at David Spinks, S P I N K S, uh, on Twitter. And there there's his, his newsletter, which is a must subscribe his book, which is a must buy. And that job board he was talking about, which you can go check out anything else I'm missing. Um, no, you, I mean, you can also just go to davidspinks.com and it has links to all the information there as well. Cool. Hopefully no AI generated copy. Nope. It's all me, baby. 100% Sphinx. 100% Sphinx, 0% AI for now. We'll let Unless you Unless know, I'm a bot and I just haven't told you. Well, rumor has it that you're so similar to me that one of us is a bot. <laughs> there's only one real Sphinx, one real Eisenberg, maybe, or 
Yeah. One of us is real, basically. Fifty percent of this podcast is correct. Is real. Well, well, it's been delightful to talk to myself. <laughs> <laughs> if you like this episode, please, please uh, tweet at us, um, and we'll bring on Spinks for more. And for those also who made it to the end here, um, go sign up to Community College. I'm bringing it back. It's a uh, a course where Spinks is actually he's shown up in the past. It's a it's a course to teach you how to build a community based product, understand niches, uh, build community, and you can go check that out at communitycollege.latecheckout.studio. Um, class starts in April. <laughs>